welcome to The Winning Mentality with me, Charlie Bosco. Joining me today is Margaret Bowling. She's a TV producer and an adventurer and holds no less than three Guinness World Record certificates for ocean rowing. She's rowed the Atlantic twice and also attempted to row the Bass Strait on an expedition that came close to ending in disaster. Towards the end of the interview, we talk about that trip and get into risk and reward in general. Margaret's got some amazing insights, particularly into quite unusual topics like staying in the moment. She talks about not looking too far into the future on a row because when you've just set off or even when you're halfway across, the thought of finishing is just too distant to contemplate in your mind. Margaret and I also discussed the difference in dynamic between being in a tiny team and a huge team. Her first crossing she did with just one other person. Her second crossing she did as part of a 16 person team. Basically this interview is exactly what you hope for when you speak to someone who's had experiences as out there as Margaret has. It's engaging, inspiring, um, insightful and sometimes quite tough to listen to particularly when Margaret talks towards the end of the interview about what taking risks does to your family. So get settled in, be prepared to be inspired and enjoy the voyage. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is a bit surreal. We actually used to work together at um, Epic TV back in the day. We might as well come clean now. <laughs> yeah, we sure did. Yeah, I think I was sort of your boss for a little while. So this is a great role reversal being put in the hot seat. I was I said we worked together. I was trying to make it sound like we were equals. Damn it, I've got my credibility to worry about. Okay, the well, cat's out the bag. I, did, I have had a boss at some Well, sort. you did shoot to stardom and uh, surpass us all, so here we are. I, I could still just about see you from the top of the mountain. But um, <laughs> when we worked together, I, I probably didn't realize I was only vaguely aware of your rowing adventures. And I think it's a really, a really interesting sport because... I know it was something I contemplated doing, and yet it's one of those things you just think about when you're out on a walk one day and then never do anything about. How on earth do you get into long-distance rowing? Um, well, I think... So I've rowed across the Atlantic Ocean twice and um, had an attempt at rowing across the Bass Strait, which is a particularly dangerous stretch of water between Australia and Tasmania. Um, and now I've got an old boat that I um, keep out in South Carolina and do long river trips on. Um, but you don't just suddenly rock up and row an ocean one day. There was definitely a long sort of history that led up to that, which probably started with, you know, growing up in Tasmania, this beautiful island location in Australia where dad would take us out in boats when I was a kid. Um, so, I mean, I remember knocking around in dinghies with oars when I was about five. Um, and it went on from there and uh, then, you know, rowed in high school. You know, had the good fortune to go to good enough schools where there was actually a rowing program. And um, then left it for a long time and came back to it in my sort of like mid-twenties and um, it scratched an itch. You know, I was in London and there wasn't much to do except go out and party and drink and so I got into competitive rowing. But it seems quite a leap from competitive rowing to long distance rowing. I mean... I wasn't aware until I talked to a surfer that surfing and big wave surfing are almost different sports. And it seems from, an, from the outside that ocean rowing and competitive rowing are the same. Um, it, they're totally different, obviously. Um, you know, ocean rowing is similar to climbing Everest or trekking to the South Pole. Um, and it's similar in the enormity of the endeavor, I think. Um, and that's what drew me to it. Um, I think the connection for me was that I was already a, a sort of competitive river rower and so it felt like an easy option out of all of those big things I could have tackled. So what's the first step? I mean, is it like doing the London Marathon where there are charity slots? How do you progress to your first long distance row? Um, well, the first step is the flash of inspiration to do this. and you know, we all get that bug and we're sitting there and we're thinking, I want to do something and we don't really know what it is. And so for me, the really key thing was just waiting until the inspiration struck. And, and that took quite a long time. You know, I was looking at doing things like the Marathon de Saab, but I hated running. <laughs> so when you say inspiration, you mean inspiration to do something. It wasn't yes. necessarily a big row. 
No, actually, the inspiration to do the row specifically, because I think that that kind of niggling feeling that I needed to do something had been present for a long time. And I walked into the boat club one day and there was a notice on the notice board that said, four Cornish boys win Atlantic rowing race. And those words Atlantic and rowing together were like, that was my light bulb moment. And I knew instantly that's what I was going to go and do. So how did you do it? I mean, did you go and find the Cornish people? I mean, how do you, how do you join a team? How do you... In a way, it's so overwhelming knowing where to start. Yeah, I think what had put me off in my early 20s in London from doing anything big was just that I didn't have the network, I didn't have the connections. Now, you know, every every party I go to, it's with a bunch of sort of crazy explorers. Back then, it was like, I didn't even know where to go buy a good pair of hiking boots in London. <laughs> um, it was so far outside the realm of possibility for me. Um, so uh, the power of Google, that's how you start these days, isn't it? I, I Googled um, ocean rowing and came up with the Ocean Rowing Society. Um, and at that time, this was something where there was like, you know, there was a place on one team in the next two years. So I applied for it. And what's the selection process? Um, there's no official selection process. It's a completely unregulated, um, fly by the seat of your pants, bullshit as a sport full of madmen. <laughs> but that's what I love about it. Um, you know, I signed up to a team with a guy who'd done an Atlantic crossing and now wanted to row around the world and was looking for people to fill legs on an Indian Atlantic and Pacific Ocean you know, three crossings, basically. He was going to stay on board all the way around. And I, um, so I went to a selection weekend, which did involve some psychometric testing and physical sort of challenge testing and testing our ability to work as a team. But actually, that was quite unusual. Mostly people sit around the, at the pub together and think, oh, you'll be all right, and then get in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm interested in the, the idea of psychometric testing. This is something you hear a lot about in sports, particularly when people are trying to artificially create a team. Yeah. What attributes are they looking for from you? Because you've got to be driven. You can't be too mellow so that you're super easy to get on with because you won't row. Um, you know, probably the thing I was most thankful for from that experience of temporarily thinking I was going to row across the Pacific with two men, um, aged 26, <laughs> um, was that, that, that we did that profiling of like personality profiling because what came out of that from me was that in our society we um, value leadership above everything else um, and sometimes we also value physical ability and that really shows through in the way we approach education in, in sort of our country or our, the West as I, I suppose is the best way to describe it. Um, so I think, yeah, the biggest thing that came out of that for me was looking at the fact that we are all parts of a pie and actually you need the whole pie to make it work. Um, and so the leadership is only one slice and you need the other eight bits to bring a team together. I'm interested when you say that leadership is the most valued quality. Do you mean that as a society we perceive that to be the most important thing or subconsciously have psychological tests proved that that's what we find appealing in others? Um, a little bit of both. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I say value, I mean it's, it's the work that's best remunerated. Um, it's, you know, championed and admired the most. Actually, the guy I want on a rowing boat with me is the guy who's going to sit there quietly and pull those oars really fucking hard and... Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> Okay, well, I did. I've got a bleep machine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, so I want on my team a guy who's going to sit there and um, be a competent, you know, individual physically, but um, not harass the rest of the team, so be fairly quiet, but also be cheerful. Um, so strong physically and cheerful is actually a much more endearing quality to someone who's leading teams than someone who's going to come in all bullshit and try and tell you how to run the show. And how are these things financed? Is this all through sponsorship? Because this is all part of the game, isn't it, for adventurers? It's funding it. Um, I borrowed the equivalent of a deposit for a mortgage to do my first expedition um, and paid huge sacrifices for a number of years afterwards as a result of that, um, which is why I think you have to wait until that inspiration strikes um, because you have to have that 
burning passion, that sort of knowing that you'll do this at all costs to get to the start line of an endeavour like this. And it, until you have that, it's probably not the right thing to do. So when you found out you had your, your place on the boat, you know it's going to happen. I can imagine there's a vast amount of physical training. Are you advised about any psychological preparation you should do? Um, well, I mean, it is, it is a, a... No, there's no advice about psychological preparation because no one really knows what they're doing. Everyone's making this up. Um, at the time that I did an ocean rowing expedition, more people had been to the moon than rowed across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you know, there were probably... 10 crews every year and a half who set off on a on an expedition and it was now there's hundreds all around the world and it's grown exponentially um but no one really knew it was like everyone just went out and did it a little bit by trial and error and I loved that about getting into something in such a, a sort of you know, it was a real time of, of the sport coming into its own. Um, you, there'd been the 70s where you had like one trip every couple of years and that was it to a place where some races were starting to happen but it hadn't really grown at all. Um, yeah, we were all just making it up as we went. And how did the experience compare with your expectation of it? Um, well, so it's quite interesting because I had independently prepared psychologically a lot. I'd obviously been racing um, in crews and competing a lot in, on the river in rowing boats um, before my first crossing. And so I, was, I had the mentality of an athlete at the time that I left. And so I had used that opportunity of training so hard physically to really train my mind too. And so I pushed myself really, really hard for a long time in the run-up to setting off on the ocean. And um, so when we got out in the ocean, actually, I'd over-psyched myself. And it wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I was gutted. <laughs> and so as soon as we, you know, hit the shitty weather and the storms started rolling in, I was like, yeah, this is what I came out here for. It's like, that was my moment. But it's a brutal routine isn't it wasn't it two hours on two hours off yeah yeah you you so I was with one other woman on that first crossing and we did yeah two hours on two hours off it's just the two of you on the boat yeah only two of us um so yeah it's relentless um actually when the bad weather does roll in it's a moment of respite because it means you can stop rowing because you're getting pushed in the other direction and there's no point because um, you kind of have to always go where the wind's going to some extent. Um, yeah, so, uh, God, yeah. It's uh, that call when you're lying in bed and, you, you know, you feel like you've just drifted off to sleep and you hear, your turn <laughs> from the deck. <laughs> it's like, actually, that's water torture. Your turn. <laughs> so you never get in more than two hours sleep, but I suppose... It's not like as soon as you stop rowing, you stop sleeping. You've got to navigate, feed yourself, wash, go to the loo. There's so much to take care of. The cumulative exhaustion must be horrific. Actually, what really amazed me on, um, on that trip was how quickly your body slots into this new routine. Um, and I felt okay. You know, I was able to do all the things I needed to do and the only time the exhaustion became totally unmanageable was when, when our motor on our desalination machine that turns your um, seawater into drinking water broke. Um, and so we had to hand pump water. So you basically attach a handle to the um, desalination machine and then you pump by hand. And I've used one of them. It's just, it's just <sighs> so slow. It's slow and it's brutal. I mean... I can't remember how much, but I feel like you had to pump for about 45 minutes to get about a cup of water out. <laughs> and you're two hours off from rowing. Yeah, exactly. So what I found was interesting after that routine of having done sort of rowing 12 hours a day, more or less, all at a very gentle pace, but 12 hours a day nonetheless, that extra hour of activity from the hand pumping tipped me over the edge. I couldn't cope. Psychologically. See, I wonder if it was. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I, that it was too much. I was exhausted. I wasn't getting enough rest. Um, and I found that quite unmanageable. 
When you say maybe it was psychological, do you mean physically you really felt like that extra hour of pumping just transformed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, really, if I look back on it now, did it? Well, it has to be psychological, doesn't it? Yeah. The thought, and, and this brings me actually to an interesting point because um, when we were emailing about meeting up, you sent me an article about how endurance athletes can sometimes speed up and the hypothesis of the... Um, the article was that clearly fatigue isn't physical because marathon runners sprint for the line, 10,000 meter runners run the last lap of the track, Mm. the fastest of all, so clearly the brain's playing a part. And I was thinking, well, actually, maybe it's adrenaline because adrenaline is such an immensely strong drug that maybe it makes a marathon runner sprint, the 10,000 meter runner do that fast lap at the end. And it made me think about you because I thought, you don't have the shot of adrenaline. No. You don't have the bell sounding and the Olympic Stadium going crazy. It's just it's no, the monotony. No, I've just got, your turn. <laughs> yeah, it's the monotony, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, psychologically, that must just be, be desperate. No cheering crowds, no encouragement, just on, yeah, off, on, well, off. It's so interesting. So other than that physical thing of actually adapting to this new routine surprisingly well... Um, The other thing that was so interesting for me was how your head adapts to that kind of environment because we were out there for 73 days. So it's, you know, you're at sea for, you think it might be two months, but it could be three. Um, You don't know how long it's going to take you to get across. And that amount of time is too far in the future to be able to imagine it, you know, for at least the first two thirds of the expedition. So you're... Um, So you're really sort of sitting there most of the way across having to just regulate how you respond to that day because you can't think past that. And I would imagine that it's something that people who are, you know, in captivity experience as well. You just, you survive that shift, that hour, that minute, whatever, however you break the time down, you're living in the moment. And actually that was quite profound. I've heard that so that I've had people say that to me when you're going through some awful interval training session or doing something, oh, just think about the next interval, but you can't. Your brain wanders and you think, well, yeah, okay, this is pretty hard now, but I've got 10 more to do. How do you stay in the moment? Um, I found that quite a natural response. It wasn't something I tried to do. Um, I think it's probably also partly about just slowing your mind down generally. There's no external kind of input when you're out in the ocean. All you have to entertain you is the sky and the sea and, you know, your teammate's spotty ass. <laughs> That's as exciting <laughs> as it gets. Um, so, you know, you're very kind of understimulated in comparison to day-to-day life here and so it's easy to just dial it right back. And that was the thing I got the most out of doing these trips was it's quite a spiritual experience for that reason. Well, I suppose that's why they do the psychological tests. It must be probably the majority of people just psychologically couldn't do that. They couldn't just dial it down to the next hour. I don't know. I think you underestimate people. I think when you're put in a stress situation, which I suppose essentially that is, you... What's really interesting is actually you can't predict what anyone's response is going to be until you put them into that environment. Was that something that made you nervous before you went, wondering how will I react? Yeah, and actually not really so much for myself, but I um, worried about how my teammate was going to react. Did you know her well before you went? Um, no, we'd met about five months before the expedition um, out of a mutual need. You know, we both, she'd had a teammate fall out, I had not gone to row across the Pacific Ocean with two blokes, <laughs> and much of my mother's relief. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, we both needed a teammate to go with, and so we teamed up. Um, and we got along really well, um, but we come from very different lives, and so um, we didn't have much in common in some ways, um, but we had an effective partnership on board. You often hear that, don't you, that um, effective partners aren't necessarily the best of friends to just share a common goal and, and a common need. But I don't suppose you actually talk to her that much, do you, during the row? I mean, you're just on and off. Surely once you're two hours on the oars is up, you just can't get in the cabin fast enough. 
No, we, chat, we chatted loads. There's actually a lot of time in the day where, I, you know, I'd be awake, like head hanging out the cabin door while she's sitting there rowing and you, and you chat. Um, we definitely know each other's lives inside out. There's not really anywhere much to go on a 23 foot long boat with a kind of deck that's not more than about 10 foot long. Um, so, yeah, but even with that level of intimacy, um, you know, those differences in our lives were definitely highlighted. Um, and it was hard to connect beyond a certain level. And so the connection came through having a really functional um, sort of approach to getting across the ocean together. And have you gone on to do future projects with her? Um, we went out to the Yukon to have a look at doing the Yukon River as an expedition together. Um, but that hasn't come to fruition. And I don't think it probably ever will, actually. We had a wonderful holiday to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's a bit hard to talk about this because she may one day listen to this but I think actually the reality for me when we got out to Canada was that we had a really great first week catching up and then I think I kind of felt a bit like actually we'd, we'd done all the talking we're ever going to be able to do in two and a half months on the Atlantic and I, I don't know if I felt like she was the right person to be doing another really long trip with at the time that you did that first row, you were the first Australian woman to do an, Atlanta, uh, an ocean row, weren't you? Yes. Yes, I was. Just so I get that quick uh, claim um, to fame in. Well, however, I really have to hold my hands up here and say that actually at the same time that I was out in the ocean, there were two women on board a four-person boat crossing the, crossing the Tasman Sea. And actually, it, they probably really have that record but because it was a C they didn't get officially recognized um, and they deserve some recognition because that is a tough expedition okay still take the credit Come yeah on. no I've still got the Guinness World Record certificate <laughs> <laughs> do you get one for the Guinness Book of yeah. Records so I got two um, so I've got three Guinness World Records uh, one for being the first Australian woman to row an ocean one for being the first Australian to row any ocean twice and one for being part of the largest team to ever row an ocean because the next trip that I did was actually with 15 other people. Okay, let's rewind a second. Um, <laughs> okay, how much time do we have? Okay, we've got plenty of time to talk. That's good. That's good. There's a lot to talk about, but I'm just interested when you got back from the first row, how it changed you um, in everyday life. Um, oh, I don't know. Actually, no, I do, know, I do know the answer to how it changed me in everyday life because um, it made me much less of a frenetic person. Um, I'm, you know, this incredible optimist and enthusiastic about everything and I dive headfirst into everything with little thought. And I think it probably made me take a pause um, and it made me just slow down my approach to everything that I do. Um, Do you feel that's a uh, positive? Hugely positive. I yeah. sort of got the impression you almost missed the manic you, but you think you you're glad you dialed it down. Yeah, no, I am. I think it's made it made me thoughtful, more thoughtful <laughs> than I was. <laughs> I'm still incredibly impulsive. <laughs> but I often wonder if people that have taken uh, big risks, and there's an, an element of risk, of course, to rowing an ocean if life feels a bit different when you get home and you don't sweat the small things quite so much. Yeah, totally. You definitely don't. Um, you know, when you... I mean, I had a couple of moments on that expedition which felt... which were incredibly terrifying. And I think, um, you know, and actually then after the Bass Strait expedition that I attempted in 2012, which didn't last very long at all and ended up in a rescue... Um, once you go through, through those experiences, it, it puts life into perspective because you've faced death and come out the other side. And, yeah, you don't sweat the small stuff. I mean, I had this incredible revelation on my first expedition, which isn't really news to a lot of people, but it was to me at the time. And it was that, that this phrase, choose your attitude, um, and that really just kind of came to me one day, sitting there rowing, where I thought, 
I was having a bit of a shitty day and I sort of thought, oh, you know, this is crap. What am I doing? I'm so miserable. I hate this. And I thought, yeah, but you didn't yesterday. And, not, and like, because you've got no external stimulus, you've actually got, you can't blame it on anything except yourself suddenly. Yeah, you haven't had a bad phone call or a bad email. No. <laughs> so choose your attitude. Tell me about that. Is that something you consciously worked on? during the voyage? Yes, it was, yeah. Um, I was, failed. Was this quite early on? Um, I, I don't remember, probably. Um, I'd like to think so, but it probably took me most of the way across to figure it out. Um, you know, I still really failed at some stuff. I, I mean, you know, when you're on an expedition, small things make a huge difference to your... Um, what well-being and state of mind and how well you treat your teammate has a huge inf you know impact on how they're feeling um, and you are, one thing I eternally regret is that Kath my teammate forever slept on the side of the cabin which had the electrics box sticking out near her head which just made that bunk that tiny bit less comfortable which in ocean rowing terms is like a huge amount less comfortable <laughs> And I never once offered to swap sides, and it was the most selfish asshole thing I've ever done. <laughs> Is this only something you reflected on afterwards? Yeah, I didn't think of it at the time. I was just being a selfish asshole. So, you know, I mean, it's great to talk about how I learned all these lessons and I became this wonderful, spiritually enlightened being, but actually, fundamentally, we're still assholes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty nice summary of life, yeah. You learn all the way, but uh, it's still there. Uh... But how long afterwards did it take you to assimilate the learnings? Are you still, do you still reflect on it and learn things yeah, from it? Yeah, I mean, it, it sticks with you forever and it's, um, it's a point of reference that you constantly go back to in your mind and, and are always learning from, definitely. Um, but I'd say, you know, the first six months, not that much. And then suddenly, as you've sat with it for a while, it probably took a couple of years from each trip to really get over the intensity of the experience and be able to reflect back on it um, with an impartial eye. Did everything feel a bit mundane when you got back? You no, say, God, say... after that lack of stimulus, I was just like so pumped to get back into life, like eat hamburgers, drink cocktails and go out and party. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, you just, some people don't deal that well with the real world once mm. they've been in an ocean row or climbed Everest or whatever, yeah. they find re-entry hard. You didn't struggle with that? No, I think I spent, you know, I used that time on board to reflect a lot about what the coming years would hold for me and then just dived into that because I'd had so much time to, like, prepare in my head for how things were going to play out that I was just ready to get involved. <laughs> um, what's interesting and I think very unusual about you is that you went back for more. I think most people tick something like that. And, uh, and call it a day. How long after the first row did you start thinking, I wouldn't mind doing that again? Oh, I knew the whole way across I'd go again. Oh, really? Yeah, from very, very early on. I mean, I just fell in love with it. That communion with nature is unlike any other experience you could ever have. And for me, you know, I just feel incredibly connected with water environments. And so it drew me back. You know, I didn't feel a need to go and sort of go up a mountain or, you know, cross an ice cap. I just wanted to be out in the water again. That's a really interesting thing to say, actually, because it seems like it didn't stimulate your need for adventure per se. It was that specific adventure. Did you feel that by going back, there was still more you could learn? Or did you basically just want the same experience again to kind of top up how you felt the first time? Um, every every sort of rowing expedition there's always more you can learn um you know i felt like i just scratched the surface on the first one um but the second trip i did because it was with such a large team you know 16 of us on that boat it um the quantity of people really distracted from the intensity of experience I'd had on the first trip where a lot of the time I was on deck on my own and just communing with nature. <laughs> um, and so when you're sitting with, you know, three other people around you the whole time, because um, we kind of rode in pods either side of the boat, so it was like a big catamaran-style boat with um, two pods with four rowing seats on each side. 
and then eight bunks in the cabin. Um, so I had, you know, this other part of a team who were constantly only feet away from me and that, um, that was quite difficult actually. Were you hoping to delve back into the, the psychology you got on on the first trip? Was that the goal, to go, to go deeper, if you like, into your own psych? <laughs> to be honest, there was no goal because um, I'd had a job at the BBC fall through and my grandmother had just given me a couple of thousand pounds and then I got a phone call saying, can you get to Morocco in a week? Someone's broken their wrist and we've got this expedition going off. Um, and I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, you know, my impulsive streak, you know, played out. And uh, a few days later, I was on the plane with kit bags full of vegetarian food, which was absolutely rank because that was all I could take through customs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, rocked up in the port in Agadir to discover this monstrous boat that looked like a bit of kind of Meccano stuck together with super glue and, a, you know slightly raggedy disorganized chaotic team and I was like yeah here we go again Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the second one like it must have just been a completely new experience um gosh the second one was was interesting because I um I think I felt like I'd learned a lot on the first and I um naturally um I naturally gravitate towards leadership roles and it was something that had come up actually when I'd done the initial team testing back in 2006 um, was that, you know, most people have, you know, a little bit of leadership and then a little bit of something else. I just had the two different types of leadership in my personality profile and one was the one where you're kind of loved and admired and one is where you're a dictator. <laughs> so I had both. Well, I did used to work for you, but I won't <laughs> pass any further comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so leadership something I, I've always striven for because I it's you know where it's where I naturally gravitate it doesn't mean I'm necessarily always good at it um, and that really played out on that second expedition because were you in an official leadership role yes I ended up in one slightly by forcing myself into it um, quite aggressively um, I had a team, you know, the team had had a um, skipper previously who had walked away from the trip. Um, probably the most senior kind of team member had then recruited another skipper who'd come into the team. Um, and then she was the one who invited me. I knew her already. Um, but it was obvious to me when I arrived that, you know, it would help to have someone else being a sort of second in command to run the other watch that she wasn't on. And so I probably slightly... I'm not going to say bullied, but um, persuaded her that I was the right woman for the job. <laughs> oh, so this was a discussion. This didn't just happen organically. No, I, I, um, I stuck my hand up and said, I think this needs to happen and I think I should do it. And yeah. um, so I ended up in this role with a team of people who'd been together for, um, you know, a good chunk of the team had actually been planning this expedition for three years. Um, they'd lost team members. They'd had a, a definitely a fraught experience getting to the start line. And um, the team was aged 23 to 68 with multiple nationalities. Um, so they suddenly, you had a group of older men in that team who had a young woman walk in who didn't know them, didn't know their MO and started bossing them around and it went down like a lead balloon. So oh, I learned some really tough lessons on that trip. That must have been a, a really valuable experience though. I yeah. Mean, how did you go about, how, did, did this turn into a big argument, a shout, a screaming match? I mean, was there a quiet mutiny? How did it come about? Yes, yeah, so, well, it was interesting. So I tried to take charge. Um, and actually, my watch, I had a very good relationship with most of the way across, and um, that was all fine. But the other watch had the majority of those older guys on it. And, um, you know, they'd do things like change the settings I'd put into the kind of um, GPS system while I was off watch without anyone realizing. And, um, you know, I would say, I think the weather's bad enough that everyone needs to wear life jackets right now and they'd just refuse. Um, so they just weren't really having a bar of my leadership, which on reflection, and this is why it took a long time to, you know, digest this experience, was fair enough. Like who the hell was I stepping in trying to tell them what to do? 
I think that's something a lot of leaders could learn from though, isn't it? We're led to believe that um, leaders and leadership is completely natural and if you have leadership qualities you will just be followed unquestioningly. But it takes some skill on your part, on the part of the leader. I mean, it sounds like you had to make pretty big compromises in how you wanted things done. Yeah, well, what happened was that actually part way into the trip, I thought, this isn't working. And I kind of just gave up trying to tell them all what to do. And I had a much more pleasant experience after that because I then just became a crewmate to them all. I still essentially kept that leadership role in some capacity, but I really dialed it down and I just had fun with the you know there were all these 23 year olds I was rowing with and I was just got really goofy and messed around with them and actually it was quite nice um, but I was constantly worried on that expedition that if something went wrong you know no one person was probably going to stand up and make sure we all got off the boat safely or that I yeah I mean it was a bit of a shit show I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Do you think you as a collective, as a crew, got away with that one slightly? Totally. There was a massive crack formed in the cabin of this Meccano superglued style boat. Um, and I, um, I drew a contour line around it, which is what you do when there's an infection on someone's skin to monitor the progress of the infection. So it was like I was monitoring the infection of the boat. And this crack grew and it grew. And I was watching it just creep past my sort of lines of marker I'd drawn on it each day. And I don't know how that whole cabin didn't just fall in half and fall into the ocean with all of us in it. It's only by a miracle it made it cross. <laughs> so what was it like getting to the far side of the Atlantic the second time versus the first? Um, I was ready for that expedition to be done. Yeah, I was... Um, how many know. days was that one? 52 days, yeah. Um, you know, the first expedition that, that I had this inc like absolutely magical finishing moment where I was, you know, we were a couple of days out and I was rowing along on my own on the dawn shift and um, a whale popped up next to the boat and spurted and then there was a rainbow in the sky and um, then there was also a black and white bird, which always, these two birds always usually flew at very different heights in the sky. They obviously had a different kind of migration pattern. But this one moment, they just both flew right next to each other by the boat. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, I can't quite describe that moment. I, it, it was like the ocean was serenading me temporarily back to land. <laughs> so finishing the second time, I mean, there was none of that. We were just, we were all, we were all done. We'd run out of food that, you know, we'd had this tough old crew of like mixed gender, mixed ability, mixed motives, um, trying to get across an ocean together on a ship that almost fell in half. And um, yeah, we were all ready to get off. Would you say you learned more on the first trip or the second? I learned more on the first trip. Uh, and that's actually been a real running theme when I talk to explorers and adventurers about big expeditions. Nothing will ever be like that first trip. So do it, do it well, do it right, you know, put your best e effort in when you're getting, getting off away on that one. So when you got to the end of that second trip, uh, what were your desires now adventure-wise? Did you know you wanted another big row? Did you think, well, I like the adventure, but maybe another type? Um, I knew I'd carry on rowing. Um, it was in my, in my blood at that point. You know, there was no escaping from that. Um, you know, that around that time, I had had a dream for quite a while to do a row across the Tasman Sea, and that's still something I'd like to do. Um, so that was playing on my mind. But I had other stuff going on in my life at that point. I was making some big transitions with things I was doing. And so rowing kind of really took a back seat. So I came off of that expedition just ready to do some other things for a little while, which is what I did. And uh, where are you now, rowing-wise? Um, well, so I then went back and did a third 
attempt at a big expedition, which was rowing from um, Victoria to Tasmania, so across the Bass Strait. Um, anyone familiar with the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race will be familiar with the Bass Strait because it's that stretch of water where all the boats usually get into trouble. It's a, yeah, just describe exactly where it is. Um, so you've got Tasmania, the island that sits just off the southeast of Australia um, and is the first bit of land that the Southern Ocean hits. Um, and the Bass Strait is the northern end of Tasmania. And so you've got the Southern Ocean coming roaring across um, and literally, you know, it's the roaring 40s down in that area of the world. Um, and then it suddenly hits Tasmania and creates a funnel through the Bass Strait. So you've got incredibly powerful sort of water forcing its way from west to east. Um, and then on the eastern side of Australia and Tasmania, you've got the Tasman Sea, and you get really weird weather currents where the warm winds from the north of um, the sort of tropical north come down the east coast, heading south, and then you get cold winds coming up from Antarctica, heading north, and they meet in the middle all around where the Bass Straits then funneling out. And, um, and so you, you get crazy weather down there. So what sort of distance are we talking? Because versus the Atlantic Ocean, this is a, a size-wise tiny stretch of water. Oh, short. I mean, we thought that trip would be like 10 days maximum to get right the way down the east coast of Tasmania. But there'd be 10 pretty full-on days. Yeah. So we got, into th we got through three of them before the boat uh, rolled over in the middle of the night and... Um, Ben, who was one of my teammates, um, got a hematoma on the nerve on his elbow, which at the time was displaying symptoms akin to a break. Um, and so we thought he'd broken his elbow in the roll. And um, that happened after, um, you know, we'd lost a lot of safety equipment off the side of the boat and we were essentially adrift in the middle of, um, you know, 40-foot cresting way steep cresting waves and um i had a moment of sheer terror unlike anything i have ever or hope i will ever experience in my life on that trip because i was with two guys i was the most experienced they were sort of hiding <laughs> i say hiding but they were bunkered down in the cabin and I was trying to make the deck safe and deploy some safety equipment, a parachute anchor, which helps sort of steer the boat in the right direction off the side of the boat. And I was just looking, you know, I was standing there on a deck in my undies with, with this swell literally looking like it's going to break over the top of the boat, steep as anything. And then I jammed my thumb in a rope as I was putting the line over the edge of the boat. And I, I just had a moment where I wanted to curl up in a ball and not be there and there was nowhere to go and so I, I remember grabbing the railing of the boat and um, oh, it makes me quite emotional talking about it actually Take your time. <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> I think you know you, that was the moment I probably felt like I've faced death even though I wasn't literally on the verge of death in that moment, it was too overwhelming. So I grabbed the railing of the boat and I just took a breath and I said, come on, Margaret, fucking sort it out. <laughs> in my best Australian accent to myself. Because um, when doing brutal self-chat, Australian accents work, it seems. So I did, I fucking sorted it out, mate, you know, and um, made the boat as safe as I could, which was not safe at all, and climbed in the cabin and hoped for the best. You're extraordinarily vulnerable, aren't you, on a rowing boat? I mean, what do you do if the boat... When you say the boat rolled, it rights itself, right? Yes, it does, yeah. So you've got... Um, you take ballast in the bottom of the boat, so the bottom of the boat is very heavy, which means that if it rolls over, it will automatically flip itself back round, as long as your cabin doors are fully shut and sealed. Um, otherwise, water gets in and you're upside down and it's not, it's not going anywhere. We were fine. We, we flipped very quickly in that capsize. So the expedition ended yeah. prematurely. Yeah. Po the, the incredible um, Victorian water police came out and picked us up in their boat Fearless um, and, and towed us back into Victoria. And <laughs> what was the emotion after that one? Did you think, maybe I've just got what I want out of this? Um, it was very difficult because 
you know, I was in constant communication throughout that night with uh, my support team. So I'd had a, you know, I had someone in the UK and someone in New Zealand providing 24 hour support. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was talking to them on the satellite phone and then they were relaying information to the Australian Maritime Authority to AMSA who were then, you know, calling me. And so there was a lot of dialogue back and forth. And then the support team were keeping our families in the loop because we were in a very precarious situation. Um, and there was one moment where one of my brothers rang the other and said something to him about what was happening and the manner in which he delivered the information made Owen think that I had died just for a fraction of a second. And, um, and then my mother also was half a world away in India at the time and woke up in the middle of the night having had this sort of dream or intuition or something about rushing water and knew something was wrong. And um, they all thought I was going to die. So I think, you know, the thing I took from that was how far are you willing to push your family for personal achievement? Yeah, and I think that's a really hard thing to wrestle with. And I think it's probably the bit of um, adventure sports that's probably missed by people observing them. And I know that before, before I got into mountain sports, and I, I used to be into skydiving and things like that, the risk seems quite glamorous. And you think it would be quite cool, and it must be cool to know what it's like to be quite close to being killed and actually it's not very glamorous at all and you actually find it quite hard to look at your family afterwards yeah i mean i it um it was horrible what i did to them um and of course it's never as bad for you because you're in the moment and you're just like getting through it and somehow you have far less worry being in the moment than they do being outside of that moment wondering if you're alive or not yeah yeah and the other thing is if something does happen it, you're probably the only person it doesn't affect yeah it's um yeah I, i'm a dad now so it's it's a little um it's a bit real yeah yeah um anyway. but you know all of that said again with some digestion and reflection i thought okay about a year later, it struck me, oh, I faced that, I could probably do something like that again. Actually, after the terror and something that made me almost cry when I was telling you about it, my reflection a year later was, okay, I've, I've like crossed this fear boundary now, what's next? <laughs> I mean, fuck that, what's wrong with us? <laughs> God, human beings do not do memory very well, do we? No, bloody goldfish. <laughs> And have you acted on that? No, I haven't. No, are there, are there plans? I think. Um, I mean, you said you got your boat in South Carolina. No. Um, actually, after that trip, um, I was very unwell for a period of time, and it probably wasn't until late last year where I knew I was a hundred percent well again. And actually, so in that five years, I. Um, where I, you know, wasn't really up to, uh, you know, there were times where I was probably up to doing a big trip, but um, actually it's not until the last few months where I've started to feel like I've got the itch again. When you say up to doing a big trip, you mean physically or psychologically? Um, physically, but then psychologically because the physical stuff that was happening was making me weaker psychologically. <laughs> I'm just laughing about the thought of humans being like goldfishes again. <laughs> so, much as I find it hard to believe, I'd have asked this question 10 minutes ago when we were both uh, getting a bit uh, misty-eyed, thinking about risk and families and everything. Do you think you, there's another big trip? Yeah, always. Yeah. Any clues? I don't know at the moment. Um, I'm waiting for the light bulb moment. <laughs> I think... Um, when I set off on the first rowing trip, I was drawn to rowing um, because it felt accessible, because it was boats and there was something about it that I knew. Um, but actually, you know, I grew up with a father who would always talk about those trips to the Antarctic and, 
you know, the early explorers. And so Antarctica has been in my blood and my soul for as long as I can remember. Just quite, just sometimes, you know, as a young person, that was a very subtle thing that has slowly built over time. So um, I haven't, I don't know yet what it's going to be, but it'll probably be something icy. <laughs> oh, sounds mysterious. <laughs> Margaret, thank you very much for your time. And I think um, I'm probably not the only person after this chat that will be texting their family and saying all the things they should have said, uh, or you should say more regularly. So um, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Margaret was as busy as ever when I spoke to her, so a big thank you to her for her time. If you'd like to find out more about her, go to www.margaretbowling.co.uk. You can also find her on Twitter at Margaret Bowling. This podcast has its own Twitter account now. You can find us at TWM Pod. TWM, of course, standing for the winning mentality. That's it for this week. I will speak to you next Sunday. Mm-hmm.